And when you go DHS2, deploy walls, giving you an error. And something you can do regularly anyway. Just do a JIT pull again, and uh, it'll bring you down the latest version. And let's just run install scripts again. Right, and then you'll be up to date. So, Gerald, that's what you have to do. And then hopefully, please report back that your problem has been fixed. That was my error for trying to work on things while I was offline yesterday afternoon. Didn't get the chance to test it properly. Okay. So, what we are going to do is to look at the database. Everybody knows that underlying DHS2 web application is a Postgres database. And Postgres database is a very complicated beast. Um, it's the, the topic of, again, again, of a workshop in itself. In fact, we did that once. I don't know if anybody here is a member of FOSFA the Free and Open Source Software Foundation for Africa. But we ran a workshop in Accra, oh, I think probably about 12 years ago now, where we managed to get one of the Postgres lead developers to come to the workshop, and he gave a two or three day um, set of sessions just on Postgres. It was fascinating. And we should actually see if we can do something similar, maybe get a webinar with a real Postgres expert. So I'm not a real Postgres expert. I know a bit. Um, I've used it for a good couple of years now. I'm going to give you the benefit anyway of what I know of what is good practice. Um, I always cautious about using the word best practice because I don't claim to necessarily have the best practice. I just have the best that I know. So. Right, what are the considerations regarding Postgres? Well, I guess kind of fairly important, really. The database is probably the most important part of your system from the performance perspective, right? If, you're, if your database is slow, then everything's going to be slow, right? If your database is fast, then hopefully everything will be fast. Um, it's also where your data is, and so it needs to be carefully managed and looked after, and particularly proper handling of backup files and things like that, right? If you're, um, it's something that you need to become more familiar with probably than any other part of your system, right? You need to be very comfortable about dealing with your database, executing queries on it, um, tweaking performance on it, backing it up, restoring it, things like that. After you've installed Postgres, by default, there's a huge library of tunable parameters, right, which you can then um, set about tuning. Um, what I've done in my install is I've created like a template. I'll show that to you a little bit later on with just some fairly easy to follow tips on how to reasonably easily get okay Postgres settings. Um, what I generally do after that is then you sit and monitor it and you watch it, right? You watch it when it's under full load, you watch it over a period of a week, or over a period of a month, and make small adjustments as you go along. Um, but before you even start with tuning your Postgres, and I'd say before you even start with trying to install DHS2, it's really important that you start off by looking at what kind of hardware that you're putting it on, be it real hardware or virtual hardware. Um, so before you install, right, um, obviously the disk and the CPU and the RAM are all quite important resources. Um, from the database perspective, mostly you want to concern yourself with what kind of disk you're trying to put it on. Um, a few thoughts around disks. 
Uh, don't. In my experience, it's the IO latency, right? It seems to be the most significant factor we see in terms of getting good database performance. Um, I, uh, over the years, looking at environments people are putting their, their Postgres on, I have found by doing a very simple latency test, I can get a reasonably good idea of how well that database is going to perform. Um, latency is diff different to throughput. Right, you can get an environment which, which promises you that you're going to get many gigabytes of seconds worth of potential throughput. Right, but usually when you're accessing your database, you're not moving gigabytes worth of files from one place to the other. Right, that's what throughput is really going to be a best measure of. Right, the best sustained throughput you can get. VMware environments will often tell you how many IOPS you're going to get. Right, um, and IOPS again in itself isn't gonna tell you whether you got good latency. Latency is, I suppose, how do you find latency? It's the time it takes, if you're thinking in terms of old mechanical disks, right? It's the time it would take the head of the disk to move from the place that it's at to the place that it needs to be before it can start doing a read operation or a write operation, right? So there's a little bit of, before you're able to read or write, right, the disk head had to move itself into position. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why SSD disks work very much faster, because they don't have a mechanical head that needs to move. Um, testing your latency is a really easy thing to do. This is, if you've got a monitor, I mean, the Moonin monitor gives you a good graph on latency. It's a good one to watch. But this little test takes half a second to run. Oops, why can't I copy and paste it? It's because it's full screen. Um, I'll run it now. This little command, dd command, all this command actually does. Let me just go to my... Sorry, this is distracting for the presentation. Anyway, here we go. So my disk, here I am on my Linode. I run dd. What dd? dd stands for... Um, DD. I actually can't remember. It's not disk, disk, duplicate, disk, DD. I actually don't remember. Anyway, it's just taking from a, an in file of dev zeros, it's just going to take a bundle of zeros, write it to an out file, um, very small file, just 512 blocks, and it's going to try to do that a thousand times. So basically, you're going to measure how, how fast does it take to write. 1,000 very small files, right? And typically on a lin node, um, you are going to get a time there of oh, well under 0.1 of a second. When the server gets a bit busy, you might even get up to closer to a second. But that's, uh, that's how long it takes to run this, this DD command. I was looking at a server last week. I won't tell you where it is, but um, again, actually it was a... VMware provisioned device, and this same test took 30 seconds. If you've got a disk which takes 30 seconds in terms of latency to be able to, to write little files, um, I mean, you can count rocks faster than that. Right? Your database is gonna perform really, really badly. So it's a good thing before you actually install anything, right? before you start with LXD, anything like that, Right. Once you've decided on what environment you're installing on, particularly your database, it might be a cloud service, it might be a physical server, it might be a VMware virtual machine you've been provisioned. Run DD on it. And if you're getting a figure here that's too high, then complain to whoever it is that's provisioning you the disk. Ask for your money back, whatever it might be. Gerald, I know that in Sierra Leone, you're using a particular cloud service provider, which I won't mention the name of, but just here in, in Dublin. Um, and they had a lot of problems over the last couple of years. Broken disk controllers or something, I think, because they were getting very, very high latency figures. So even if you're getting from a cloud provider, check it, see what kind of disk you're getting. Um, you want to see a good low number there. Counts as a low number. Let me go back to my box. 
presentation. A good SSD disk should be giving you something under 0.1 seconds. Um, as we saw there on Linode, I'm getting like 0 0.08, 0 0.07. If you run the same test on your laptop, you're probably going to get something in the same order if you've got an SSD disk on your laptop. Um, and if your server is giving you figures like one to three seconds or over five seconds, then you need to stop and think. I mean, if, if your server's got a disk that's slower even than your laptop, is that the right kind of disk to be putting a database on? The answer is no, it's not. All right, people spend a lot of money on servers and disks. Uh, you want to make sure that your disk is performing properly before you think about putting Postgres on it. If you're configuring a physical environment, that's a lot of fun. Unfortunately, we don't get to do it so much anymore. Um, it's more difficult, I guess, than there's a slightly broader range of skills involved than simply getting a cloud service. But, um, yeah, if you've got a bundle of disks, put them in RAID 10 for a database, right? You're going to get like twice the performance that you'll get if you put them in RAID 5. Um, it's going to cost you more, I guess, because you only get half the usable disk in RAID 10, but you get what you pay for. Um, if you are buying, if you're trying, configuring a machine, trying to put it together, much better than buying two, a, a big one terabyte disk, buy eight 500 gigabyte disks instead, right? Buy, buy more smaller disks are going to perform much better than this one bigger disk. And also you're going to get some, some benefits in reliability, um, redundancy and the like. Other thing to bear in mind, if you're using something like my LXC containers, um, as I'm going to show you shortly, they don't, all don't have to use the same disk, right? I mean, fast SSD disks are expensive. And you might have a combination of slower disks and faster disks. It's possible to configure your storage pool so that you can tell your Postgres, use the fast disk, not the slow disk. Um, if you've got a cloud service, that probably not something that you would need to do. Um, yeah, the fact, so do this command before you start, check the latency on your disk and check it regularly or have some kind of monitoring tool like Moonin will show you what your latency figures are. Because just because you started off getting good results over time, you may start getting less and less good results. That can be because the disk controller is failing or it can be the in your national data center, you started off having the whole machine to yourself, but over a period of months, they've over provisioned it and put more and more and more machines on it. And suddenly you're getting much less and less direct access to the disk. Um, if you're really interested in Postgres performance, um, join the Postgres performance mailing list, right? You can Google that. I don't have the link for it. Um, that's what I do. Um, if I'm dealing with uh, Postgres database, it makes sense to, to be on the mailing list. There's all kinds of interesting discussion there. Um, that's where you'll learn um, probably the most in terms of becoming a better Postgres manager. Okay, so that's before you install. Make sure you've got a good disk. What other tip can I give you? Yeah, I've said that if you have... If you have fast disks and slow disks and the like, um, LXD is very flexible in that in that regards. And this is a very, I suppose, slightly naive way, but a very simple way um, to make sure that your your Postgres gets onto a onto a quicker disk. I'll just show you briefly how you would do that. Um, I'm going to leave the slides again quickly. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to do first before I actually do it. Right, we work on an assumption here that we've got a fast disk and it's mounted here on mount fast disk. Right, whoops. Back. Then one of the things, we already have a storage, we've seen it's called default. And we can create a new storage pool in LXE. We'll call it fast disk. And we tell it again to use a directory file system. And the source of that disk is sitting there. Then you can provide a switch so that 
when we're creating a new a new Postgres container, we want to create a container called FastPG, right? Which is a public will be for running Postgres on. We can specify minus S when we create it. Say that use this particular storage pool rather than the default, right? And that will put your your um, database on a different disk. Okay, that's a that's a that's a very simple way to do it. You can be much more nuanced about that. Um, but particularly, I mean, the, the proper way to do it, I guess, is to take the Postgres data directory, take the Postgres well logs and things like that, and write them all to separate disks so that you're, you're getting the maximum bandwidth out of each one. But this is a quick and easy way of um, getting yourself onto a different disk. Sometimes you might need to do it. There are other reasons for getting yourself onto a different disk than because it's faster. Um, it might be bigger, right? You might have a particular disk, disk which is much bigger, and that's where you want to put your database. It might be encrypted. We've not talked much about encrypted disk, but um, if you had a disk volume that was encrypted and you want to tell your Postgres to install itself onto that volume rather than onto the default, this is the way to do it, minus S. Okay, do I need to demo that? Uh, uh, let's do it. Um, just quickly, it shouldn't take long. Move this thing out of the way. Okay, let's have a look at our storage. We see we've just got that, our default storage there. Um, this is every time I make a container, it's going to put itself in there. In fact, if you go and look inside that directory, you'll find the root file systems of all your containers. Um, we're working on the artificial scenario that we've got a separate disk called fast disk, which is mounted there on on old fast disk. So one of the things that we want to do is I can say LXC storage. The storage create it's the storage create um, i'm just going to use the dir file system again um and i'm going to say that the source for this storage pool is just mount fast disk error so um I'm gonna give it okay. I didn't give it a name. The name the name of my storage pool I want to call fast disk. Okay. Now I've made a new storage pool, as easy as that. This the mount there you see whoops. There we can see. And now I have two storage pools. The default, as you see, is now being in use by five containers and a couple of images as well. My fast disk currently is not being used, right? Nobody's using it yet. Let's make a new container quickly. LXC launch. Um, should do all of these demos using the Alpine distribution because it's just much quicker. Specify the storage. Please make this container sit on my fast disk. We want to call this my fast database. And everything is exactly the same as before. The only difference is that it's going to use a different storage pool. Um, now, if I do a storage list, I can see my fast disk is being used by one container. Yeah. The reason for doing that, if you're running on a cloud server, which in most cases, I think it's becoming probably the most common way to deploy, you're less likely to have this much control over what kind of disk resources you have and how fast each one is. Um, certainly if you're working in a physical environment, if you're working in a VMware environment, um, you can make sure that your VMware administrator provisions you with a fast disk, which you can test using the DD command. Um, and once you're happy with it, make a separate storage pool for it um, and put your Postgres on it. 
kind of a waste to use this expensive disk for putting things like your Tomcat containers and the like, because they don't need a fast disk. All they do is write logs, primarily. Now, I guess DHIS in particular does write quite a lot of logs. In fact, it writes much too many logs. We had a complaint recently um, where DHS writing about 14, 15 gigabytes of log per day, which is pretty crazy. That's something that I think we need to work on with the developer team that we cut down that logging to something more reasonable, particularly because people do have to pay for disk resources. And it's crazy making these massive log files. But anyway, database as say it's all about the disk. And if you've got good disk, you want to be able to use it. Um, sometimes you want to be able to move a container to a different disk. And again, this kind of quite commonly might happen with Postgres. I mean, you may have been running for a while, um, and then you got yourself a container called fast disk, um, or you got yourself some new disks, and you want to be able to move an old, move a container off an old storage area and put it onto the new storage area. That's easy enough to do. You can do it using the move command. Um, so you would stop the Postgres container, move it. You have to give it a different name, right? So move it from Postgres. Now we call it Postgres 1 and specify the storage fast disk. This command could take quite a long time if your database is big. It's actually now going to copy the data off one disk onto another. And then we can just change the name back to Postgres again. You see, move Postgres 1 back to Postgres. And after that, everything will continue to operate as it did before, but your Postgres will be sitting somewhere else. Um, note that this move command, we're just using it to move containers around within the same host. If you've got a number of, number of different hosts in some kind of a cluster, it's also pretty much the same command really to move containers from one, one host to another. You just need to specify the remote host as part of the command. Um, yeah, I keep I keep mentioning ZFS and then saying we're not really going to talk about ZFS. <laughs> I think we'll have to, we, we should maybe, if there's interest, we might organize a separate little seminar, maybe outside of the framework of this academy for people who want to delve into ZFS. But ZFS got lots of, advantages, particularly with using the database. Um, there's a nice presentation. It's a little bit old and about running Postgres on ZFS. It goes into a lot of detail on, on using the snapshots and things like that. It's old. It's from about 2012. Um, ZFS has been around for a long time, actually, much longer than that. But one of the things it notes at the end of the presentation is that ZFS is not production ready on Linux yet. And that was true back in 2012. Um, it's very much production ready, particularly say, in Ubuntu 20.04. That's the main reason why I moved from 18.04 to 20.04, particularly so that we can do things like encryption at rest and stuff like that. But yeah, if you have a simple enough requirements, stick with the DIR file system. If, you have, if your disk is crap and you can get a better disk somehow, then it's easy enough to move your containers from one disk to another. Um, okay, besides the disk, I mean, there's also things like the RAM and the CPU, which are important. Um, Postgres likes RAM. It'll use whatever you give it, um, which is a good thing. It won't let it go to waste. And um, whatever Postgres doesn't use directly, it makes use of the fact that the operating system will cache, will cache on the disk. And so the more RAM you can give your Postgres, the happier it's going to be. So don't starve it. Don't try to run your Postgres on, on like one gig of RAM or whatever. It'll still run, but it's not probably not going to be able to do what you need it to do. Um, if you have a really, really slow disk, which sometimes is the case, um, you can compensate quite a bit sometimes for having a very slow disk by just having a lot of RAM. If you have a lot of RAM, then the operating system will cache a lot of disk writes and sometimes you can get reasonable performance out of it. Um, 
I think this is the case in East South Africa. They had a lot of Postgres servers running on some pretty good high quality spinning disks. And you feed those servers with enough RAM and they actually perform quite well. Um, probably not as good as SSD, but a hell of a lot cheaper than SSD. Anyway, because Postgres likes its RAM, it's also important to limit it. it seems a bit counterintuitive, but it's true. Um, if I think about my little cloud server that I've been using for the demo here, I've got 16 gigabytes of RAM on it. Um, maybe more typically, I might have a 32 gigabyte of RAM machine. If I put two Tomcat instances on it, and I know those two Tomcat instances, maybe they're going to use about 16 gig of RAM with their different heap settings. Then it's quite important that I tell my Postgres not to use all the RAM because we need to leave some behind for the post for the Tomcats. Otherwise, it won't work. Right? They may fail to start because of insufficient RAM. So what I would generally do after I've set up Postgres on a server, <coughs> decide how much RAM you have, decide how much RAM you're going to allow your Postgres to use for itself on the understanding that Postgres will be greedy and it'll use whatever you give it. Um, once you've figured out what you can afford to give it, you can do this config, whoops, this config command to make sure that your Postgres stays within those limits. Okay, besides RAM, Postgres also does use CPU um, and a lot of the DHS2 processes in particular, particularly around index generating for analytics, um, even just handling lots of parallel requests. Um, it's gonna use CPU for, um, yeah, for complex queries. It uses them for doing string comparisons and building hash sets and doing all kinds of things. So obviously, the more CPU you have, the better it's going to the better it's going to scale. Um, on a heavily loaded system, you might need to limit it. Um, so, or if you've got if you've got forty eight CPUs, you might decide that well, you're not going to give all forty eight CPUs to Postgres. Um, as I mentioned, I think earlier this morning, there's two ways really to, what's happened here? This thing is in my way. Move my mouse out of the way. There's two ways to, to limit your CPUs. You can actually just kind of hardwire it and tell Postgres to use particular CPU numbers or uh, probably more flexibly, you can set an allowance on it. Um, I say what I typically do, I don't jump into doing this right away because um, it's better to watch the system over a month or two to see how it's going, to find out how, what the CPU requirements might be of your different containers. It's a good idea always to set an allowance of like 95% just to make sure that there's no container can completely hog the system. Um, and over time, you might want to limit that a bit more once you've understood better how the load is being shared out. <laughs> but yeah, the moral of this little slide, I guess, is give it as much RAM as you can afford and then make sure you set a limit to so that it's only going to use the amount of RAM you've decided that it's going to use. And um, think about limiting the CPU, but do these CPU limits gradually over a period of time as you understand more the way your system is running. Okay, tuning, right? As many of you will already have seen if you installed DHIS2, it's quite a lot of key parameters that you need to set up on it to work, to work nicely. Things like shared buffers, work mem, uh, I can't remember them all, I'll show them to you in a minute. Um, one of the things that I do encourage not to do is to go into your postgresql.conf and start searching for all these parameters and changing them there. Part of the reason for not doing that is it becomes really hard for you to know what you changed and what you didn't change, right? A much neater way of doing it um, is to put all your tunings together in one file. So I have this set up by default, right? Under conf D, there's a file called dhispg.com. And this file gets loaded after the main postgresql.com file. 
So the way that those parameters work is that the, the ones that are set last are the, are the ones that will get applied. So what is it, whatever's in your postgres.com file, this effectively will override that and set them afresh. So a quick look at that file. Um, where is it? Where am I? Okay, here I am. Let's have a quick look into our Postgres container. Um, in we go. Okay, this is the place that people generally start poking around in, right? The postgresql.com file. My advice, I would leave this file alone. It's, it's very nicely commented, which is kind of useful. It's good to use this for reference, see what the different parameters mean. When I'm making changes, I don't make them in here, right? We have set up especially for your convenience. File in here for your DHIS Postgres configuration. And in here, these are the common parameters, and this is the stuff that we've got from the from the main DHIS2 documentation. These are the things you typically want to be able to set. Maximum connections, the shared buffers, the work mem, and these various things down here, all of which are explained elsewhere. So I won't go into them in a lot of detail. Max connections, what should that be set to? Well, really depends primarily on how many DHIS instances are gonna be using the same database. Um, when you fire up a DHIS instance, it creates a database, a pool of database connections, something called uses C3PO, I believe it's called. Uh, our documentation says that the pool size that it creates is 40. Um, I think we, we need to update our documentation because I've realized that, in fact, somebody's changed that, that the pool size is actually 80, right? So the default pool size you get if you install DHIS2 is 80 connections. There are some case places within DHIS2 where we make sneaky little connections outside of the pool. We really shouldn't do that, but we do. So if I've got one DHIS server, I would say I need 80 connections plus a little bit of overhead. So I would set my max connections for as, as 100 in that case. 200 to I, I basically, I guess, 100 connections per DHIS2 instance, depending on whether you've changed the size of the pool in your DHIS setup. Just if I remember, I'll go back and show you that, but we're going to look at that in another session anyway, when we look at Tomcat. Okay, so that's max. If you set your max connections too high, it's not going to break anything, right? Max connection doesn't actually do anything except set an upper limit. Um, if you set it too low, you will get errors with your DHS failing to make connections. If you set it too high, um, Basically, you're exposing your Postgres to the possibility of having more connections than it can handle in terms of, particularly in terms of the RAM, um, and it might pop. So I've made this, I try to make this as easy as possible. So we've, on this particular Postgres, I'm gonna say I'm gonna give it 16 gig of RAM, right? So I'll limit that in the way that I showed you earlier. So I know I've got 16 gig of RAM to work with, so I'm gonna give, four of that to shared buffers. You really don't make this higher than 25%. I always used to try to make shared buffers as big as possible. But if I had a load of RAM, um, I'd use a load of shared buffers. And it actually become, I'm not sure where the tipping point is. When you've got large amounts of RAM, having huge shared buffers becomes less useful than giving some of that RAM to the operating system to use for cache. So don't make this too big. You might, as I say, set it to something. And um, these are ballpark figures. You might watch it over time and try tweaking them a little bit. This is kind of from our, our uh, manual. Um, 20 meg is given as a reasonable 
as a reasonable size for your work mem. The thing about work mem is that it's used by each of your connections. So you need to think about, well, if you've got 100 connections, well, in our case, we've got 200 connections, right? We've got 200 connections multiplied by 20 megabytes of work mem. That means this can potentially use up to four gig of RAM, right? Um, so we've already allocated potentially eight gig, right? Four to shared buffers and possibly up to four or four max connections. Keep that in the back of your mind as we move along. But the maintenance work, man, this makes a really big difference with things like generating indexes, um, which is something that's used a lot during analytics generation. Think of the big aggregate systems. Make it as big as you can afford. Um, usually you can't afford to make it too big. 512 meg is probably okay in this case. I've got 16 gig in total. I would set it at that to start with. Um, bear in mind as well that these are the settings that we are putting together for a system that's meant to be running the DHS application. There are times when your system, you're gonna use it for something else other than running the DHS application, one of which is restoring database backups. But I'll talk about that in a subsequent slide. Effective cache size is quite an important parameter for the Postgres query planner. Uh, Postgres has to, when it gets given a query, before it exits, it has to make a plan. How is it gonna set about executing this? The plan generally consists of um, how is it going to get stuff off the disk? Is it going to use an index? And a lot of that plan is dependent on how much memory it thinks it has available. So effective cache size, you're giving it a bit of a hint how much memory you think it should have available. Here's an approximate formula here. Your available RAM, we've got 16 gig. Take away the maintenance work mem. Um, that's half a gig. Take away the max connections multiplied by the work mem. It's another four gig. So what am I left with? Yeah, 11 and a half. So we can give it, given on the understanding that all of these connections are probably not active all at the same time. I think something like 12 gig is a good estimate. Right, we give that to our planner to say, well, if you are making a query plan, think about doing it within within 12 gigabytes of RAM. If you set that wrong, right, if you say effective cache size is 128 gigabytes of RAM, right, it won't break the system, but what it will do, it'll cause your query planner to make really bad plans. Right, because a query planner will start off thinking it's got 128 gig of RAM. It'll then discover after it's tried to do that that it doesn't have 128 gig of RAM at all, and it's going to have to revise its query. Similarly, if you set it too small, if we set our effective cache size is only one gig of RAM, um, then it's got to make very inefficient queries because it thinks it's only got a little bit available. So this is a hint to the planner. Most of the rest of the stuff you can leave it as is. There is some planet, there is some um, quite a lot of documentation on this elsewhere. Uh, random page cost. This is working on the assumption that you've got an SSD disk, right? Basically, telling this is another hint to your query planner. Tell you how fast is your disk? If you've got a really slow disk, right, then you don't want to tell it that it's got a random page cost. What you Give it a much higher random page cost. Say, well, the random page cost is four or 10 or, or something like that. So you're telling your query planner in advance if it's making query plans that involve a lot of disk accesses, um, that it's quite costly to access the disk. Okay. So I'll save my configuration for a moment. Let's go back to the slides. Um, so yeah, tuning, best idea for tuning, I think, I will, it's again, it's opinionated, it's my opinion, put your tuning together in one place in the, in the, in the config file, um, rather than poking around in the main, in the main PostgreSQL.conf. It's got some advantages. Um, you can keep, 
you can keep copies of different configurations. You can easily see what the set of customizations are that you have done. Um, and as I've said, I've given you a, a, a kind of template file which doesn't have any tuning set on it, or it doesn't have much tuning set on it, but it's easy enough to customize it to your setup. Um, I kind of briefly mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning again that sometimes it's useful to have different versions of the file optimized for database restoration. Um, a lot of you, particularly working with some of the really large databases, will know that restoring a database can take quite a lot of time. Uh, it's not unusual to be taking an hour or more right, to restore a database. Um, there are things you can tweak in your Postgres settings to make this database restoration much, much, much faster. Um, and yeah, I've given you a few little hints here. The, obviously, when you're restoring a database, you're not going to have 800 connections to it. Typically, you're only going to have one. Um, so you don't need to worry so much about your maintenance work, mem, right? Maintenance work, mem, what we did in the calculation before, we multiplied it by how many connections we were expecting to have. If you're only expecting to have the one doing the restore, you can give yourself oodles of maintenance work, mem, right? Give yourself four gigabytes in this case. Uh, maybe that's too much. One gigabyte instead of 20 megabytes. Similarly, your, your um, work mem, which I've said, okay, sorry, maintenance work mem. Yeah, that's, that's the stuff that's used for creating indexes, we'd set it as, as I can't remember what I set it as. Um, we set it as half a gigabyte, 512, 512 megabytes. Increase that hugely, give it four gigabytes. Um, turn F-Sync off, this is an interesting one. In F-Sync, if you read any of the documentation on Postgres, there's huge warnings. Do not ever turn F-Sync off because F-Sync is what provides you the guarantee that when Postgres thinks it's written something to the disk, it has actually written it. Um, that's really important not to turn F-Sync off when you have your Postgres running with its, with its database installed. Uh, it's to protect it against things like power failure, right? If your power fails halfway through, halfway through um, the day, then um, as long as you have F-Sync on, the chance of your database getting corrupted is, is very low. When you're restoring a database, on the other hand, um, if I get a power failure halfway through restoring the database, then uh, I'm just gonna delete it and do it again, right? It's no big crisis. And turning F-Sync off will make the database restore a lot, lot faster. You just need to remember to turn it back on again after you've finished. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of ideas around tuning. And as I say, sometimes it makes sense to keep a couple of, to have some different tuning files. You may have a separate tuning file that you pop in for when you want to do a restore. Um, otherwise, the defaults that are in this override file with the commented suggestions is going to do you in most cases. Okay, so if you have a database, you need to be able to run queries on it. Um, I don't know, I've always used Unix pipes for running queries. You don't have to, you can do minus F. There's some advantages with pipes. This is typically how you, if I've got a query in there, my, my query.sql, I just need to cat it straight into um, PSQL on the, on the database server. Um, Generally a good idea, particularly if you've got complicated queries, don't go to PSQL on the command line and start typing out the query. And chances are you're probably gonna make mistakes anyway. Best thing is put the query into a file and just throw the file at the database like this. It's gonna return you the result. You might want to capture the result, in which case you're just gonna redirect the output like that. That's gonna store you your output onto the, onto the host. Maybe I can do that quickly. Um, and it remember what's running where. I think I still got that. Wish. Okay, I should have an HMS, HMIS database in there. It'll be fairly blank, not much in it. 
but let's make a query called uh, select star for users. So to run that query, I'm going to go at. That just helps the query and send that into a pipe. So send that to Galaxy Exec HMIS HMIS. And the name of my database on there will be called HMIS. It's on the Postgres server, so I exec on the Postgres server. Run that on the HMIS database, and there you can see there's my query output. There's just the admin user because remember we just we just um, install this thing from blank. If I want to collect the output of that, I can do that. My result text, and there I should have my results. So that's how you run a query. Um, I mean, there's different ways to do it. That's probably the most convenient way in most cases. Um, um, using pipes, say a pipe command into LXC exec, I find just the most convenient way of doing things. Um, you can also do it, you can also do it remotely, right? Using SSH with a pipe. If I wanted to get to run a query on the database and get the result onto my laptop. This is the way I would typically do it. I'll, I'll pick my query, send the query to SSH to the server on the server, run LXE exec postgres da, 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 and then collect the results back to my laptop. Um, I don't know if you want me to, I, I won't demonstrate that for you now. We're going to talk about SSH in a different session. Um, to be aware of if you just run LXE exec postgres psql like that then it will run as the root user in the database um, part of the setup script we've actually created a database user called root specifically to allow them to do this that has some implications uh, particularly when it comes to restoring databases, because if you if you restore a database using that root user, then by default, everything that you do is gonna be owned by the root user. So there's a little thing you need to do to reassign the ownership um, of your objects in the database. But I think I'm talking about soon. Yeah, dealing with backups. Okay, again, um, it's all about the disk. Here's an example of the wrong way to take a database dump and restore it to a database. Now, I give this as an illustrative example because this is the most common thing that I see most people would do. If I had said, as a little task, can you take the Sierra Leone database and restore it onto uh, your database server? <laughs> People will do this. They'll go and SSH into the server. Then they'll go and download the Sierra Leone dump file. Then they'll unzip it, because you can see that it's zipped. And then if they know the LXE commands, they're going to push that file into the Postgres container. Then they're going to exec bash into the Postgres container, and they're going to uh, run the backup SQL file onto the particular database, in this case, a database called DHIS. Okay, there's a horrible, horrible, horrible thing to do, all of that. Um, and primarily because, and it's really slow, right? Um, it's going to take you a long time to restore a database like that, particularly if your database is very big. Um, the reason why it's kind of horrible, I guess, is as I say, it's all about the disk. In this case, we're actually writing this 
compressed database to the disk here, where they do the wget, right? It's gonna pull that file from somewhere right to the disk. If that's a very big file, many, many gigabytes, it's gonna take you some time. After that, we're gonna unzip it, which means we're gonna write the disk yet again, right? This time even bigger. Um, that can also take you a long time and start using up quite a lot of your disk space as well. Then we're gonna take the file and push it into our Postgres container, which is gonna make a second copy of the same big file, right? So now we've written the file to the disk twice and we've written the compress file to the disk once. And then finally, we're gonna read the file and install it into the database. Um, there's much more neater way to do that, but there's also quite a big security concern about operating like this. Um, we tend to go to quite a lot of efforts to secure the database reasonably well. Um, and one of the things that completely destroys any kind of security you might gain from um, controlling access to your database is if you leave database dump files lying around all over the place, right? And it's kind of a very common security audit thing that I typically do go and look into people's home directories and see how many database dumps are sitting in there, right? Um, I can guarantee probably we've got 66 participants currently on the call. If I would go into the home directories of at least 50 out of the 66 of them, I'm going to find database dumps in their home directory and they probably won't be protected in any way. So yeah, try to avoid database dumps on the disk. What's a better way to do it? This is the way I like to do it. Okay, what was wrong with it? Okay, I've just said really what was wrong with it. What's a better way to do it? Well, we can do it all with all in one. Um, and that way you can ensure that the database never touches any of the disks at all until it gets written to its final destination. And all it is taking the same commands really, and putting them into single pipeline. And let's do it. Let's do it just for fun. We need to make a DHIS database first before we can do it. We'll do that after. Um, so move this thing out of the way again. So we need a we need a DHIS database to restore into. Let's just. Um, if we'd made a DHIS instance, we'd already have one, um, but we'd have to delete it again. So let's imagine we were restoring it into our existing HMIS database. The first thing I would do, let's good idea, stop our Tomcat before we pull the database from underneath its feet. Right, it won't like that. So let's stop the stop the Tomcat. Then we can go straight to our database server and drop the database. <laughs> Good idea to do a backup of this first, right? Um, make sure you have a backup. Um, I think I'll show you about backups shortly, but let's just drop the database. Now we need to make make it anew again because we want this thing to be blank. Um, this is important. We want it to be owned by HMIS user, right? That's just the way the system works. Every Every instance has its own database and it connects to it as its own user. Horrible thing that we see often, I think we maybe even nearly encourage it in our way our manual is written. Um, everybody uses a user called DHIS. So you might have 53 databases, all of which are owned by the user DHIS. The problem with that is if your DHIS user gets compromised, one of the one of the DHIS.conf files in one of your instances um, gets compromised, then the username and password for that database is also the same username and password for your 53 other databases. So bad idea using a common DHIS user for everything. Make a separate user for each database in each instance. We got a new blank database called HMIS. Let's try and restore the, the Sierra Leone dump to it. Um, so I'm gonna go with all you get minus O and um, that just means wget is going to take its output and dump it to the standard output stream rather than saving it to a file. That's 
puts it in a good format that we can then tip it. So we take the output of that command, push it into gun zip, it'll unzip it. And then we take the output of that command and we send it into the database and the database is actually called HMIS. <laughs> this is relatively quick to do. Um, and the important thing about doing this is you, if you look at that command carefully, you'll notice nowhere, anywhere in it, do I write anything to the disk at all, except at the very last stage when we're writing it into the database. Um, this is kind of really important if you're dealing with things like encryption at rest, right? If you've got a sensitive patient database and you want to make sure that your database is on or is encrypted at rest, so it's on an encrypted partition. But if you leave copies of the dump file lying around, then um, you're basically going to destroy any benefits that you might have got. Uh, what I should have done before doing this is I should have tuned my Postgres a bit, as I was saying, to make it a bit faster on the database restore. That will probably bring this down to about a quarter of the time. Because currently, okay, there we are, done. Okay, so that's the command, it's on the slide. Um, you can use variations of this, but the main point is to use pipes. Don't save things into files unless you really, really, really need to. Um, one thing that is important to note, somebody might have noticed when we were doing the restore, there was a whole lot of errors on the front saying user DHS doesn't exist. Now that's because of the way the database dump has been created. It's a little bit ignorant on our part, really. We kind of assumed with the Sierra Leone database dump that you have a user called DHIS. Um, we don't have a user called DHIS, so that's why we got those errors. Um, generally speaking, to make your database dumps portable, it's better not to save the the information about who owns the objects because you've got no guarantee where you're going to restore it on the other side whether that same user exists or not let's quickly go and look at that database um we now should have the whole demo database in there not to go look at it in detail but the important thing to look at is this you see everything is owned by root um now my problem will be when I connect this database from Tomcat using the HMIS user, it's going to get all kinds of permissions errors, right? Unable to create objects, unable to do various things. So a query you do need to run after restoring in this way is a very simple reassign. Reassign owned by root to HMIS. Now it looks like that. Much better. And after this, I can fire up my. Oh, they closed. I don't want to do that. I can fire up my HMIS server again. This time it'll come up running the Sierra Leone demo database. Okay, Windows people will probably find all of that a bit confusing, right? Unix people have been working with pipes all their lives. Um, piping is one of the most powerful things to do. Um, and yeah, certainly with handling of database files, it's very useful to try and keep them in a pipe rather than put them on a disk in most cases. Okay, this is another example. What's this example about? Okay, this is quite a common thing. I'm not actually going to demo it, but it's just an example of a similar technique, if you like. It's quite common to have to move a database from one machine to another. Um, lots of use cases for when this might happen. Um, you might simply have a new machine and you want to move stuff. Um, it might be that you have Postgres 12 running and you've now created a new machine with Postgres 13 on it. So you want to move the database from, from the one to the other in order to get it upgraded. Again, you can do this with a pipe. Um, if I've got, um, 
Yeah. If I'm sitting on machine A, I can go LXE exec Postgres G dump. So I'll make a dump. I'll leave out the analytics, you know, analytics files for a database called DHIS. Minus O, what minus O flag does, that will dump the database, but without dumping any of the ownership information. Um, but yeah, that'll stop you getting the errors on the other side if you don't have a similar user called DHIS on the other side. So I can take this file, dump it, gzip it, and then pipe it into SSH the B machine, and on the B machine, I can unzip it again and LXE exec it into the database container on the B machine. So this would move the database compressed and encrypted from a database server on one machine to a database server on the other, um, and without touching the disk anywhere in between. It's something that you can practice, right? Look an example of Python. I think we have gone over time. How far am I on my slides? I have four or five slides to go. Will we continue or will we wrap it up? What's the feeling? Maybe you can use the Zoom chat. We talk primarily here about restoring rather than backing up. Um, I can say certainly from looking at DHIS instances over the last 10 or 12 years that most definitely the number one security issue faced by many installations, I would say probably most installations, is the lack of a working and a tested backup plan. Um, if you were to do a risk register, we need to have a security workshop to talk about risk registers. But if you were to do a risk register, then you were gonna write down what all your risks are and to rank them in terms of what's the most serious. The two most serious ones that are always sitting bubbling at the top. One is that you don't have a system administrator or you only have one and he's thinking of leaving. And the other is you don't have a backup plan. Or if you do have a backup plan, nobody's monitoring it, nobody's checking it. And as a result of this, um, quite regularly, in fact, sadly, much too regularly, we see data loss. Yeah, we talked earlier, somebody might, have, might delete the virtual machine. Somebody can wipe up the container. Um, anything can happen. Lamin will remember his machine can catch fire. Um, if you don't have a backup plan, you're going to lose data. People do lose data regularly. Sometimes people have lost many years worth of data. And the simple reason why they've lost the data is they don't have proper backups. Uh, or they've accidentally deleted their backups. Or they've not tested their backups. They think they have backups. But when they go to try to restore them, they discover that their backups are corrupted for some reason or another. Uh, they don't have their backups stored off the machine and preferably off out of the data center. I was joking a bit about Laminde in the Gambia, but they had a really terrible instant a few years back when they had a fire in the data center. Um, and when something like that happens and you don't have backups, you can be in a lot of trouble. The number one reason why there are no database backups, I mean, I think it's quite simply because it's not written in anybody's job description that this person is responsible for doing the database backups, right? Um, and that's part of having a, a part of having a security plan is working out whose responsibilities are what and who gets fired because there's no database backup. Um, and you don't want to discover this after the fact, you need to discover it by doing regular audits. Anyway, the popular demand, we put back the automated, automated backup process. With the old DHS tools, people will remember that it used to take database backups onto the local disk by default. We left that out with this, this set of tools, partly because it's very complicated to try to figure out how things are going to get customized in different environments. People might have different kind of disks, different places where they want to put backups, different frequencies for doing backups. Trying to make an automated process that meets everybody's requirement was kind of tricky. Um, and what we've done, I guess, is just to provide the template. You just need to enable it. Um, and you may then want to customize it. I think I described it here, yeah. 
there's a file. You'll find it in there, user local, etc. DHS, DHS, Q minus env. And then there's a cron job. Um, so you can set some parameters in the file, enable your cron job, and you should get backups regularly happening. In fact, if there's an automated job to do it, doesn't mean that it still shouldn't be somebody's concern to be checking these things, make sure that they are happening. So there's a file. where you specify where you want your backups to go, right? This is on the host machine. Um, this might vary. You might want to put it into a different place. This is where it's going to go by default. Um, then you need to decide what databases that you want to pick up. In my case, on this machine, I only have one. Up here. I just can open this as roof and I can do it. Um, I'm happy enough with our PG backups for the moment. Um, so I only have one database on the machine called HMIS, and I want that one back. Okay, so you can have a list of all your databases in here. In our case, I only have one. I'm just doing a plain backup. I'll talk about encrypted backups in a second. Um, and backups get rotated, is the important thing, because if you've got a naive backup, then it just says take a backup every night then within a month or two your disk is going to is going to run out right because database backups are quite big and dhs doesn't lend itself very well to incremental backups because of the whole analytics table thing <coughs> so the way this thing works basically and we've run this in lots of places it's kind of fairly battle tested by now it'll keep a rotating seven days of backup so um, if we decide the day of the week, so it'll keep backing up every night. Um, and after it gets to the seventh backup, it's going to start deleting the older one. So it keeps you the last seven days. Um, what we can also do is specify that Sunday's backup, in this case, day seven, we always keep the weekly backup. And that way, you keep your seven days rolling backup, but you also have a weekly backup of every Sunday. And then you can decide to keep three weeks of that. And um, it will also keep a monthly backup on the first day of the month. If you run it like this, it means that your disk space is not going to get chewed up quite so quickly. Because at any given moment in time, you've got seven daily backups and three weekly backups. So you know you've got 10 backups. And you'll also have one backup for every month. That way you can estimate your disk growth quite simply. Um, so yeah, this script will just run, I think we can run it manually. It's gonna be DHIS2, I'll probably have to run it as soon. If I run a backup script, it's gonna read that, it's gonna read that DHIS2M file. It's discovered that there was no var PG backups. If I remember correctly, it should have created it then. It'll create the var PG backups. And it's busy making, I can see it's working because it's taking time. It's backing up that um, Sierra Leone database, um, demo database now. Right, that's it. We should find it in there. Um, Something I need to do, I think, is work a little bit on the permissions of the backups because, yeah, the own by route then, we don't really want to have the backups to be world readable. It's, it's not too bad because they're sitting on the host, but even so, we can make that better. So, all that's required then to get your backups working is to do that, to go into that file and make sure these settings are the way you want them. And then to get it to run regularly, you're going to go to this file. We've decided that because we tend to make loads of cron jobs, it has to for various things. It's better to give it its own file inside etc. cron.d. You can put all your DHS2 related cron jobs in here. And one of them is this. So we set this 
at 25 minutes past eight in the evening. It's going to run DHS2 backup. Um, you can set that to a different time. I tend to set it for early evening usually because that's kind of the end of the work day. So most of the data entry will have been done by then. It's a good time to back it up before you start doing heavy jobs around midnight on the database. So if I set it like this, then I should find tomorrow I'll have a new backup. Uh, this is today's backup, 2021-02. I'll get 2021-03-04, and it'll keep seven of them and then start rotating. Uh, okay, don't really have time to talk too much about the encrypted backups, other than what I've said. Yeah, well, if you look at it in the file. Um, it is possible to encrypt your backups, and sometimes it's a good idea. Maybe it's always a good idea. I haven't actually decided whether it's always a good idea or sometimes a good idea. There's a big danger with encrypting backups, right? Particularly for archive purposes. If you want to be able to access this backup that was made 10 years ago, if you don't have the key that was used to encrypt it, then you won't be able to access the backup from 10 years ago. So uh, sometimes there's lots of advantage of encrypting backups. Um, one of them is you can you can make them easily accessible, downloadable on a website somewhere that you can download the backups. You know that they're encrypted. You can store them off in other cloud storage somewhere, S3 storage, whatever it might be. But be careful if you encrypt them and you lose the key, then you can't access them the same as anybody else can't access them. The way it it's, the way it would work on here is simply a matter of um, uncommenting that and making a list of databases that you want to get encrypted. Um, we might have had a tracker database on here that we wanted to encrypt, for example, and we would put it in like that. I've got to comment it back out again. You need a password file to use to, which will be used for encrypting the backup. This file needs to be protected. And you need to make sure that you have a very safe copy of it somewhere, and preferably more than one copy of it, and preferably more than one person got access to it. In fact, you need a security policy around management of keys to deal with this properly. Because as I say, if you lose the key, you're not going to be able to decrypt it. But if you want to do it, this is the way you do it. You just uncomment those two lines, then all of those databases will be um backed up and encrypted at the same time. Right. I think I've mentioned all that in here. Okay, I didn't talk about the remote. Um that's the other thing that you can do. <coughs> uh, to make it easy um what i'll do i'll try and demo this next time rather than just talk about it but because it's a little bit fiddly to chat to to set up but one of the the ways we've been handling remote backups up to now most commonly is that you allow your your machine to be able to ssh into another backup machine archive machine whatever you want to call it that ssh needs to happen using keys and passwordless and then all of your backups can be automatically synced to the off-site directory maybe we'll give that as an exercise to do okay i've mentioned a little bit about encryption passwords if you create a password file don't lose it um here's a simple way to make a to make an encrypted file or encrypted or to make a, a strongish password 40 hex characters, for example, you just do it like that, that will create your file, set your permissions on it properly. Um, one of the things we've been talking about of late, Morton in particular wants to do this soon, so that's good, so you can help us, um, is to make use of S3 storage for storing the backups, partly because it's just much cheaper um, and it's quite convenient. Work well with. <laughs> Will work well, particularly with encrypted backups. Okay, just a quick 
talk about what's going on when your database is running. <coughs> you have the moon in monitor installed by default. It gives a couple of really useful graphs. Um, probably the most useful one is this one, where you can see the number of connections by day um, on your database. Um, you can see here this database has got 80 connections. And as it gets busy during the day, number of connections on it increases to 200. Um, the yellow stuff means that you've got some problem on the Tomcat server typically, right? Because that means that uh, transactions are idle. Probably some problem with CPU starvation on Tomcat. You'd have to go and look at that. You can look to see if you have a lot of connections waiting for lock, it's the blue stuff can sometimes indicate a problem particularly with tracker unfortunately but yeah it's a very useful graph just to get a quick overview of the health of transactions which are getting onto your database <coughs> this is another useful graph how big is your database right common thing that happens is that your disk fills up um the other common thing that happens is people think like if you were to look at this example you would think I need one point, what is that? One point six terabytes of disk. If I was to look at the disk usage at this time here, sometime during the night we get this huge increase in disk usage. Um, and if you're not monitoring it over twenty four hours, you won't see that spike. That spike is happening because of generation of analytics tables. Quite important to know how the spike is because that lets you know how much disk you need. Um, but yeah, Moonin is pretty ugly looking, but it's got, I think, some quite useful graphs, particularly for the database. If you want to know what's going on right, 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 right now, right, instantaneously in time, this is a really useful query here. Um, I'm not going to run it for you now, um, but this basically is going to, it's going to list out all the queries that are currently running on the database, sorted by um, the time that the transaction has been running. I find this generally useful if, if I'm troubleshooting, um, something is not performing very well, I want to see what queries are currently running. It's kind of so useful that um, I actually made a little script for it. You can run this DHS to DB activity and the name of your Postgres container. And it'll just tell you, give you a snapshot of which queries are actually running, all the ones which are not idle, um, what state they're in can be useful even to to run this periodically if you're if you're trying to track down a problem you know that there are some troubled queries that are happening you're not but every time you look they're not happening right you don't know when they happen um sometimes it's useful to sample this maybe every five minutes you can make a little cron job and collect all the results analyze it at the end of the day to see what queries were running <laughs> Things like PG Top give you a quick look at it as well. Um, but then you reach a problem. If you do find there's a query in there that's taken ages to run um, and you want to try and find out where does it come from, it doesn't really help you. Um, right? There's nothing here that says which DHS to API requests are going to result in this query um, being launched. And that's where yeah, it's my latest, latest love of the last six months, I guess. I started using this thing called Glowroot everywhere. This is an example of a very simple um, profiler, uh, which you can install alongside your Tomcat. Um, it's not part of the automated install at the moment. Um, we should make it so because... I think after using it for six months, we've decided it's really so useful. One of the things that Tomcat, I mean, what Glowroot will show you at any minute, moment in time, you can see here, show you the actual API requests, and which ones are consuming on average most of the time in this particular server. I won't tell you which one it is. I've scrubbed out some of the, from some of the information there. This API data value sets is expensive, right? We're using 58.3% of all of the server time is <coughs> just processing this. So immediately just logging into Glowroot, it's given us some useful information, 
right? We know if we're going to try to optimize anything on this server, it looks like the place to look is going to be API data value sets. We can look again with glow roots on the slow traces and we can see yeah, some of these taken up five minutes, right? That's really problematic. Um, if you click on one of these traces, we can dig into it a little bit. And in this case, it takes us straight to the problem. This is just part of what we see when we click on one of those. But first of all, it shows you the queries that are being executed by this API call. <clears throat> and one of the things that I noticed looking at this, this queries are not bad, right? This is 100 seconds, 100 milliseconds. It's okay. The problem is this thing has taken nearly five minutes, and the problem obviously is not the database. Um, if we look in here, it becomes immediately clear there. If you can see the allocated memory, 26.4 gigabytes. That's what's caused the problem. All right. So this API call has resulted in a huge allocation of memory. Um, and that generally results in a lot of CPU use. The garbage collector goes crazy trying to clean up the memory. <coughs> and we go. We end up with these very, very long request times and also uh, a lot of excessive CPU usage just to process those particular API calls. Anyway, what I wanted to illustrate here is just that it's a very useful tool. Um, we use it a lot to to isolate queries which are which are causing trouble. The example I gave you, in fact, not a very good one because this example actually illustrates that there's nothing wrong with a query, but that's in itself good information to have. We're going to talk more about troubleshooting, I think, in the last section. There's, there's so many different things to look at. Uh, sometimes it's confusing. Having a few useful tools is helpful. Being able to interpret what you're seeing on those tools is a little bit more difficult to teach, right? That's something that does come with experience. But yeah, that's me finished talking about Postgres, I think. No, I had one more slide. Then I will let you all go. Okay. Um, I didn't put aside a section for security in this, in this academy, which is really unusual. I almost always, well, in fact, have always done. We've done a security section. Um, instead, I guess what I'm going to try to do is talk a little bit about security in almost every other session. Um, so a couple of thoughts around security on your database. These are just thoughts, but um, as you've seen, the database is running inside a container. It's not that easy to connect to it from the outside world. Right? Tomcat is allowed to connect to it, but we've made it even quite constrained in the way Tomcat can connect to it. Um, it's tucked away like that for a reason, right? The last thing that you want to happen is for your database somehow to be exposed on the internet. Um, again, we've got experience of seeing some really horrible examples of that, where you were able to directly connect to a country database. In fact, not even using a username and password. I've seen that twice. Um, so yeah, we tuck it away for a reason. Don't go opening it up again, um, unless you know exactly what you're doing. People like to try to connect to the database with PG admin. People like to connect to it using ODBC. Um, in general, don't do it. Um, if you have a need for doing kind of extra database analysis, um, that's a pretty good idea. You know now that you're gonna have you're going to have good backups and you've stored your backup somewhere. You can restore the backup and work on a copy. Um, it's not a good idea to connect lots of third party tools to the DHS to running production database. <coughs> if you really do have to connect to it for some reason or another, then the proper way to do it is using an SSH tunnel, which I will talk about next week. Um, Note, I've already shown you this already, the, D the database, each database is owned by its own user, not the DHS user for everything. Um, the most common pattern, I'd say probably 70% of all the DHIS2 installations in the world, people have got a DHIS user, which connects to it. 
Um, and if they have five databases, the DHS user connects to all five of them. I talked about that before. Access controls, as I said, is managed through pghba.conf and UFW. Uh, the default settings, the way that we have it set up with kind of these automated scripts um, is fairly strict. Um, but that's good. I would keep it that way unless you've got some really good reasons to change it. Talked before, don't leave your backups lying around on the disk. Don't even store them on disks if you don't have to. <laughs> um, an important point, if you put your database on a different machine, right? Um, the way we're working currently with the setup that you've seen up to now, your Tomcat is running effectively on the same host machine as the database server. They're just both running inside containers. So the network that the traffic is going from Tomcat to the database is not running through a real network, right? It's running through a virtual network. Um, and it's running unencrypted. When you use a connection URL, like, um, I don't know, you, you've seen the connection URL. If you need to run it on two different AWS instances, for example, then what you don't want is your traffic from Tomcat to the database traveling unencrypted through the cloud provider's network. Um, and the way you can do that is you need to change the connection URL a little bit like this to make sure that the connection between the database and the Tomcat server is encrypted. Okay. We could have a weeks long academy just around Postgres, but that's just a few helpful thoughts, I hope, on using Postgres reasonably securely and reasonably safely. <laughs>